Hello, and welcome to this compilation of six of Lovecraft's dream-related stories, purpose of which is to help guide you to your own dream journey, or, at the very least, blissful unconsciousness. Now, being Lovecraft, I wouldn't call these dreams pleasant, though only one is a true nightmare. But we'll start off with a more placid dream journey in the story The White Ship. So let's get started. I am Basil Elton, keeper of the North Point light that my father and grandfather kept before me. Far from the shore stands the gray lighthouse above sunken, slimy rocks that are seen when the tide is low, but unseen when the tide is high. Past that beacon for a century have swept the majestic barks of the seven seas. In the days of my grandfather, there were many. In the days of my father, not so many. And now, there are so few that I sometimes feel strangely alone, as though I were the last man on our planet. From far shores came those white-sailed argosies of old. From far eastern shores, where warm suns shine and sweet odors linger about strange gardens and gay temples. The old captains of the sea came often to my grandfather and told him of these things, which in turn he told to my father, and my father told to me in the long autumn evenings when the wind howled eerily from the east. And I have read more of these things and of many things besides in the books men gave me when I was young and filled with wonder. But more wonderful than the lore of old men and the lore of books is the secret lore of ocean. Blue, green, gray, white, or black, smooth, ruffled, or mountainous, that ocean is not silent. All my days have I watched it and listened to it, and I know it well. At first it told to me only the plain little tales of calm beaches and near ports, but with the years it grew more friendly and spoke of other things, of things more strange and more distant in space and in time. Sometimes at twilight the gray vapors of the horizon have parted to grant me glimpses of the ways beyond, and sometimes at night the deep waters of the sea have grown clear and phosphorescent to grant me glimpses of the ways beneath. And these glimpses have been as often of the ways that were, and the ways that might be, as of the ways that are. For ocean is more ancient than the mountains, and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. Out of the south it was that the white ship used to come when the moon was full and high in the heavens. Out of the south it would glide very smoothly and silently over the sea, and whether the sea was rough or calm, whether the wind was friendly or adverse, it would always glide smoothly and silently, its sails distant and its long strange tiers of oars moving rhythmically. One night I espied upon the deck a man, bearded and robed, and he seemed to beckon me to embark for fair unknown shores. Many times afterward I saw him under the full moon, and ever did he beckon me. Very brightly did the moon shine on the night I answered the call, and I walked out over the waters to the white ship on a bridge of moonbeams. The man who had beckoned now spoke a welcome to me in a soft language I seemed to know well, and the hours were filled with soft songs of the oarsmen as we glided away into a mysterious south, golden with the glow of that full, mellow moon. And when the day dawned, rosy and effulgent, I beheld the green shore of far lands, bright and beautiful, and to me, unknown. Up from the sea rose lordly terraces of verdure, tree-studded and showing here and there the gleaming white roofs and colonnades of strange temples. As we drew nearer the green shore, the bearded man told me of that land, the land of Zar where dwell all the dreams and thoughts of beauty that come to men once and then are forgotten. And when I looked upon the terraces again, I saw that what he said was true, 
for among the sights before me were many things I had once seen through the mists beyond the horizon, in the phosphorescent depths of the ocean. There too were forms and fantasies more splendid than any I had ever known, the visions of young poets who died in want before the world could learn of what they had seen and dreamed. But we did not set foot upon the sloping melodo- mel- meadows of Tsar, for it is told that he who treads them may never more return to his native shore. As the white ship sailed silently away from the templed terraces of Tsar, we beheld on the distant horizon ahead the spires of a mighty city. And the bearded man said to me, This is Thalarian, the city of a thousand wonders, wherein reside all those mysteries that man has striven in vain to fathom. And I looked again at closer range and saw that the city was greater than any city I had known or dreamed of before. Into the sky the spires of its temples reached so that no man might behold their peaks, and far back beyond the horizon stretched the grim gray walls over which one might spy only a few roofs, weird and ominous, yet adorned with rich friezes and alluring sculptures. I yearned mightily to enter this fascinating yet repellent city, and besought the bearded man to land me at the stone pier by the huge carven gate a carriel. But he gently denied my wish, saying, Into Thalarian, the city of a thousand wanderers, many have passed, but none returned. Therein walk only demons and mad things that are no longer men, and the streets are white with the unburied bones of those who have looked upon the Adelon Lothi that reigns over the city. So the white ship sailed on past the walls of Thalarian, and followed for many days a southward flying bird whose glossy plumage matched the sky out of which it had appeared. Then came we to a pleasant coast, gay with blossoms of every hue, where as far inland as we could see basked lovely groves and radiant arbors beneath a meridian sun. From bowers beyond our view came bursts of song and snatches of lyric harmony, interspersed with faint laughter so delicious that I urged the rowers onward in my eagerness to reach the scene. And the bearded man spoke no word, but watched me as we approached the lily-lined shore. Suddenly, a wind blowing over the flowery meadows and leafy woods brought a scent at which I trembled. The wind grew stronger and the air was filled with the lethal, carnal odor of plague-stricken towns and uncovered cemeteries. And as we sailed madly away from that damnable coast, the bearded man spoke at last, saying, This is Jura, the land of pleasures unattained. So once more, the white ship followed the bird of heaven over warm, blessed seas fanned by caressing, aromatic breezes. Day after day and night after night did we sail, and when the moon was full we would listen to soft songs of the oarsmen, sweet as on that distant night when we sailed away from my far native land. And it was by moonlight that we anchored at last in the harbor of Sona Neal, which is guarded by twin headlands of crystal that rise from the sea and meet in a resplendent arch. This is the land of fancy, and we walked to the verdant shore upon a golden bridge of moonbeams. In the land of Sona Neal, there is neither time nor space, neither suffering nor death. And there I dwelt for many aeons. Green are the groves and pastures, bright and fragrant the flowers blue and musical the streams, clear and cool the fountains, and stately and gorgeous the temples, castles, and cities of Sonanil. Of that land there is no bound, for beyond each vista of beauty rises another more beautiful. Over the countryside and amidst the splendor of cities rove at will the happy folk, of whom all are gifted with unmarred grace and unalloyed happiness. For the aeons that I dwelt there, I wandered blissfully through gardens where quaint pagodas peep from pleasing clumps of bushes and where the white walks are bordered with delicate blossoms. 
I climbed gentle hills from whose, whose summits I could see entrancing panoramas of loveliness, with steepled towns nestling in verdant valleys, with the golden domes of gigantic cities glittering on the infinitely distant horizon. And I viewed by moonlight the sparkling sea, the crystal headlands, and the placid harbor wherein lay anchored the white ship. It was against the full moon one night in the immemorial year of Tharp that I saw outlined the beckoning form of the celestial bird and felt the first stirrings of unrest. Then I spoke with the bearded man and told him of my new yearnings to depart the remote Cathuria, which no man hath seen. To depart for remote Cathuria, which no man hath seen, but which all believe to lie beyond the basalt pillars of the West. It is the land of hope, and in it shine the perfect ideals of all that we know elsewhere, or at least so men relate. But the bearded man said to me, Beware of those perilous seas, wherein men say Cathuria live, lies. In Sona Neal there is no pain nor death. But who can tell what lies beyond the basalt pillars of the west? Nathless, at the next full moon, I boarded the white ship, and with the reluctant bearded man left the happy harbor for untraveled seas. And the bird of heaven flew before and led us toward the basalt pillars of the west. But this time the oarsmen sang no soft songs under the full moon. In my mind, I would often picture the unknown land of Cthulhu with its splendid groves and palaces and would wonder what new delights there awaited me. Cthulhu, I would say to myself, it is the abode of gods in the land of unnumbered cities of gold. Its forests are of aloe and sandalwood, even as the fragrant groves of Cameron, and among the trees flutter gay birds sweet with song. On the green and flowery mountains of Cthulhu stand temples of pink marble, rich with carven and painted glories, and having in their courtyards cool fountains of silver, where pearl with ravishing music the scented waters that come from the Grottoborn River Narg. And the cities of Cthulhu are cinctured with golden walls, and their pavements also are of gold. In the gardens of these cities are strange orchids and perfumed lakes, whose beds are of coral and amber. At night, the streets and the gardens are lit with gay lanthorns fashioned from the three-colored shell of the tortoise, and here resound the soft notes of the singer and the lutenist, and the houses of the cities of Cthulhu are all palaces, each built over a fragrant canal bearing the waters of the sacred Narg. Of marble and porphyry are the houses, and roofed with glittering gold that reflects the rays of the sun and enhances the splendor of the cities as blissful gods view them from distant peaks. Fairest of all is the palace of the great monarch Doria, whom some say to be a demigod and others a god. High is the palace of Doria, and many are the turrets of marble upon its walls. In its wide halls many multitudes assemble, and here hang the trophies of the ages. And the roof is of pure gold, set upon tall pillars of ruby and azure, and having such carven figures of gods and heroes, that he who looks up to those heights seems to gaze upon the living Olympus. And the floor of the palace is of glass, under which flow the cunningly lighted waters of the Narg, gay with gaudy fish not known beyond the bounds of lovely Cthulhu. Thus would I speak to myself of Cthulhu, but ever would the bearded man warn me to turn back to the happy shores of Sona Neal, for Sona Neal is known of men, while none hath ever beheld Cthulhu. And on the thirty-first day that we followed the bird, we beheld the basalt pillars of the west. Shrouded in mist they were, so that no man might peer beyond them or see their summits, which indeed some say reach even to the heavens. And the bearded man again implored me to turn back, but I heeded him not, for from the mists beyond the basalt pillars I fancied there came the notes of singer and lutenist, sweeter than the sweetest songs of Sona Neal. 
and sounding mine own praises, the praises of me who had voyaged far under the full moon and dwelt in the land of fancy. So to the sound of melody the white ship sailed into the mist betwixt the basalt pillars of the west. When the music ceased and the mist lifted, we beheld not the land of Cthulhu, but a swift, rushing, resistless sea over which our helpless bark was borne towards some unknown goal. Soon to our ears came the distant thunder of falling waters. To our eyes appeared on the far horizon ahead the titanic spray of a monstrous cataract, wherein the oceans of the world dropped down to a abysmal nothingness. Then did the bearded man say to me with tears on his cheek, We have rejected the beautiful land of Sona Neal, which we may never behold again. The gods are greater than men, and they have conquered. And I closed my eyes before the crash that I knew would come, shutting out the sight of the celestial bird which flapped its mocking blue wings over the brink of the torrent. Out of that crash came darkness, and I heard the shrieking of men and of things which were not men. From the east, tempestuous winds arose and chilled me as I crouched on the slab of damp stone which had risen beneath my feet. Then, as I heard another crash, I opened my eyes and beheld myself upon the platform of that lighthouse from whence I had sailed so many aeons ago. In the darkness below there loomed the vast, blurred outlines of a vessel breaking up on the cruel rocks. When I glanced out over the waste, I saw that the light had failed for the first time since my grandfather had assumed its care. And in the later watches of the night, when I went within the tower, I saw on the wall a calendar which still remained as when I had left it at the hour I sailed away. With the dawn I descended the tower and looked for wreckage upon the rocks, but what I found was only this, a strange dead bird whose hue was as of the azure sky, and a single shattered spar of a whiteness greater than that of the wave tips or of the mountain snow. And thereafter the ocean told me its secrets no more, and though many times since has the moon shone full and high in the heavens, the white ship from the south came never again. Thus concludes the white ship. To continue the good times, we have a much shorter story, Azathoth, one of Lovecraft's more hopeful stories, I think. Let's proceed. When age fell upon the world, and wonder went out of the minds of men, when gray cities reared to smoky skies, tall towers grim and ugly, in whose shadow none might dream of the sun or of spring's flowering meads, when learning stripped earth of her mantle of beauty, and poets sang no more save of twisted phantoms seen with bleared and inward-looking eyes. When these things had come to pass, and childish hopes had gone away forever, there was a man who traveled out of life on a quest into the spaces whither the world's dreams had fled. Of the name and abode of this man but little is written, for they were of the waking world only. Yet it is said that both were obscure. It is enough to know that he dwelt in a city of high walls where sterile twilight reigned and that he toiled all day among shadow and turmoil coming home at evening to a room whose one window opened not on the fields and groves, but on a dim court where other windows stared in dull despair. From that casement, one might see only walls and windows, except sometimes when one leaned far out and peered aloft at the small stars that passed. And because mere walls and windows must soon drive to madness a man who dreams and reads much the dweller in that room used night after night to lean out and peer aloft to glimpse some fragment of things beyond the waking world and the grayness of tall cities 
After years, he began to call the slow staling stars by name and to follow them in fancy when they glided regretfully out of sight, till at length his vision opened to many secret vistas whose existence no common eye suspects. And one night, a mighty gulf was bridged, and the dream-haunted skies swelled down to the lonely watcher's window to merge with the close air of his room and make him a part of their fabulous wonder. There came to that room a wild streams of violet midnight glittering with dust of gold, vortices of dust and fire swirling out of the ultimate spaces and heavy with perfumes from beyond the worlds. Opiate oceans poured there, litten by suns that the eye may never behold, and having in their whirlpools strange dolphins and sea nymphs of unrememberable deeps. Noiseless infinity eddied around the dreamer and wafted him away without even touching the body that leaned stiffly, stiffly from the lonely window. And for days not counted in men's calendars, the tides of far spheres bear him gently to join the dreams for which he longed, the dreams that men have lost. And in the course of many cycles that tenderly left him sleeping on a green sunrise shore, a green shore fragrant with lotus blossoms and starred by red camelots. Thus concludes Azathoth. This next story demonstrates the fickleness of dreams. What starts off a wondrous vision quickly turns to something more sinister. This is what the moon brings. I hate the moon. I am afraid of it. For when it shines on certain scenes, familiar and loved, sometimes makes them unfamiliar and hideous. It was in the spectral summer when the moon shone down on the old garden where I wandered. The spectral summer of narcotic flowers and humid seas of foliage that bring wild and many-colored dreams. And as I walked by the shallow crystal stream, I saw unwanted ripples tipped with yellow light as if these placid waters were drawn on in resistless currents to strange oceans that are not in the world. Silent and sparkling, bright and baleful, those moon-cursed waters hurried I knew not whither, whilst from the embowered banks white lotus blossoms fluttered one by one in the opiate night wind and dropped despairingly into the stream, swirling away horribly under the arched, carven bridge, staring back with the sinister resignation of calm, dead forces. And as I ran along the shore, crushing sleeping flowers with heedless feet and manned ever by the fear of unknown things and the lure of the dead faces, I saw that the garden had no end under that moon. For where by day the walls were, there stretched now only new vistas of trees and paths, flowers and shrubs, stone idols and pagodas, and bendings of the yellow litten stream past grassy banks and under grotesque bridges of marble, and the lips of the dead lotus faces whispered sadly and bade me follow, nor did I cease my steps till the stream became a river and joined amidst marshes of swaying reeds and beaches of gleaming sand the shore of a vast and nameless sea. Upon that sea the hateful moon shone, and over its unvocal waves, weird perfumes brooded. As I saw therein the lotus faces vanish, I longed for nets that I might capture them and learn from them the secrets which the moon had brought upon the night. But when the moon went over to the west and still tide ebbed from the sullen shore, I saw in that light of old spires that the waves almost uncovered and white columns gay with festoons of green seaweed, and knowing that to this sunken place all the dead had come, I trembled and did not wish again to speak with the lotus faces. Yet when I saw far out in the sea a black condor descend from the sky to seek rest on a vast reef, I would fain have questioned him and asked him of those whom I had known when they were alive. 
This I would have asked him and he, had he not been so far away, but he was very far, could not be seen at all when he drew nigh that gigantic reef. So I watched the tide go out under the sinking moon and saw gleaming the spires, the towers, and the roofs of that dead dripping city. And as I watched, my nostrils tries to close against the perfume conquering stench of the world's dead. For truly, in this unplaced and forgotten spot, had all the flesh of the churchyards gathered for puffy sea worms to gnaw and glut upon. Over those horrors, the evil moon now hung very low, but the puffy worms of the sea need no moon to feed by, and as I watched the ripples that told of the writhing worms beneath, I felt a new chill from afar out whither the condor had flown, as if my flesh had caught a horror before my eyes had seen it. Nor had my flesh trembled without cause, for when I raised my eye, I saw that the waters had ebbed very low, showing much of the vast reef whose rim I had seen before. And when I saw that this reef was but the black basalt crown of a shocking Akon, whose monstrous forehead now shone in the dim moonlight and whose vile hooves must paw the hellish ooze miles below, I shrieked and shrieked, lest the hidden faces rise above the waters, lest the hidden eyes look at me after the slinking away of that leering and treacherous yellow moon. And to escape this relentless thing, I plunged gladly and unhesitatingly into the stinking shallows where amidst weedy walls and sunken streets, fat sea worms feast upon the world's dead. Thus concludes What the Moon Brings. Staying with the moon theme, this next story is The Thing in the Moonlight. The moon truly reveals horrors to dreamers. Brace yourself. Morgan is not a literary man. In fact, he cannot speak English with any degree of coherency. That is what makes me wonder about the words he wrote, though others have laughed. He was alone the evening it happened. Suddenly an unconquerable urge to write came over him, and taking pen in hand he wrote the following. My name is Howard Phillips. I live at 66 College Street in Providence, Rhode Island, on November 24, 1927, for I know not even what the year may be now. I fell asleep and dreamed, since when I have been unable to awaken. My dream began in a dank, reed-choked marsh that lay under a gray autumn sky with a rugged cliff of lichen-crusted stone rising to the north. Impelled by some obscure quest, I ascended a rift or cleft in this beetling precipice, noting as I did so the black mouths of many fearsome burrows extending from both walls into the depths of the stony plateau. At several points the passage was roofed over by the choking of the upper part of the narrow fissure, these places being exceeding dark and forbidding the perception of such burrows as may have existed there. In one such dark space I felt conscious of a single, singular accession of fright, as if some subtle and bodiless emanation from the abyss were engulfing my spirit, but the blackness was too great for me to perceive the source of my alarm. At length I emerged upon a tableland of moss-grown rock and scanty soil, lit by a faint moonlight which had replaced the expiring orb of day. Casting my eyes about, I beheld no living object, but was sensible of a very peculiar, peculiar stirring far below me. Amongst the whispering rushes of the pestilential swamp I had lately quitted, 
After walking for some distance, I encountered the rusty tracks of a street railway and the worm-eaten poles which still held the limp and sagging trolley wire. Following this line, I soon came upon a yellow vestibuled car numbered 1852 of a plain double-trucked type common from 1900 to 1910. It was untenanted, but evidently ready to start the trolley being on the wire and the air brake now and then throbbing beneath the floor. I boarded it and looked vainly about for the light switch, noting as I did so the absence of the controller handle, which thus implied the brief absence of the motorman. Then I sat down in one of the cross seats of the vehicle. Presently, I heard a swishing in the sparse grass toward the left saw the dark forms of two men looming up in the moonlight. They had the regulation caps of a railway company, and I could not doubt but that they were the conductor and motorman. Then one of them sniffed with singular sharpness and raised his face to howl to the moon. The other dropped on all fours to run toward the car. I leaped up at once and raced madly out of that car and across endless leagues of plateau till exhaustion forced me to stop, doing this not because the conductor had dropped on all fours, but because the face of the motorman was a mere white cone tapering to one blood-red tentacle. I was aware that I only dreamed, but the very awareness was not pleasant. Since that fearful night, I have prayed only for awakening. It has not come. Instead, I have found myself an inhabitant of this terrible dream world. <clears throat> that first night gave way to dawn, and I wandered aimlessly over the lonely swamplands. When night came, I still wandered hoping, hoping for awakening. But suddenly, I parted the weeds and saw before me the ancient railway car, and to one side, a cone-faced thing lifted its head and in the streaming moonlight howled strangely. It has been the same each day. Night takes me always to that place of horror. I have tried not moving with the coming of nightfall, but I must walk in my slumber, for always I awaken with the thing of dread howling before me in the pale moonlight, and I turn and flee madly. God, when will I awaken? That is what Morgan wrote. I would go to 66 College Street in Providence, but I fear for what I might find there. Thus concludes The Thing in the Moonlight. Now from that depth we rise again to more pleasant dreams, where we shall search for long-lost dreamscapes in Celeface. In a dream, Karanis saw the city in the valley, and the seacoast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward the distant regions where the sea meets the sky. In a dream, it was also that he came by his name of Karanis, for when awake, he was called by another name. Perhaps it was natural for him to dream a new name, for he was the last of his family, and alone among the indifferent millions of London, so there were not many to speak to him and remind him who he had been. His money and lands were gone, and he did not care for the ways of people about him, but preferred to dream and write of his dreams. What he wrote was laughed at by those to whom he showed it, so that after a time he kept his writings to himself, and finally ceased to write. The more he withdrew from the world about him, the more wonderful became his dreams, and would have been quite futile to try to describe them on paper. Karanis was not modern, and did not think like the others he wrote. Whilst they strove to strip from life its embroidered robes of myth, and to show in naked ugliness the foul thing that is reality, Karanis sought for beauty alone. When truth and experience failed to reveal it, he sought it in fancy and illusion, and found it on his very doorstep, amid the nebulous memories of childhood tales and dreams. 
there are not many persons who know what wonders are open to them in the stories and visions of their youth. For when as children we listen and dream, we think but half-formed thoughts, and when as men we try to remember, we are dulled and prosaic with the poison of life. But some of us awake in the night with strange phantasms of enchanted hills and gardens, of fountains that sing in the sun, of golden cliffs overhanging murmuring seas, of plains that stretch down to sleeping cities of bronze and stone, and of shadowy companies of heroes that ride caparisoned white horses along the edges of thick forests. And then we know that we have looked back through the ivory gates into that world of wonder which was ours before we were wise and unhappy. Grannis came very suddenly upon his old world of childhood. He had been dreaming of the house where he was born, the great stone house covered with ivy where thirteen generations of his ancestors had lived, where he had hoped to die. It was moonlight, and he had stolen out into the fragrant summer night through the gardens, down the terraces, past the great oaks of the park, and along the long white road to the village. The village seemed very old, eaten away at the edge like the moon which had commenced to wane. Karanis wondered whether the peaked roofs of the small houses hid sleep or death. And the streets were spears of long grass, and the window panes on either side were either broken filmily staring. Karanis had not lingered, but had plodded on as though summoned toward some goal. He dared not disobey the summons for fear it might prove an illusion, like the urges and aspirations of waking life, which do not lead to any goal. Then he had been drawn down a lane that led off from the village street toward the channel cliffs, and had come to the end of things, <clears throat> to the precipice and the abyss where all the village and all the world fell abruptly into unechoing emptiness of infinity, and where even the sky ahead was empty and unlit by the crumbling moon and the peering stars. Faith had urged him on, over the precipice and into the gulf, where he had floated down, 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 past dark, shapeless, undreamed dreams, faintly glowing spheres that may have been partly dreamed dreams, and laughing, winged things that seemed to mock the dreamers of all the worlds. Then a rift seemed to open in the darkness before him, and he saw the city of the valley glistening radiantly, far, far below with a background of sea and sky, and a snow-capped mountain near the shore. Karanis had awaked the very moment he beheld the city, yet he knew from his brief glance that it was none other than Selaface in the valley of Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian hills, where his spirit had dwelt all the eternity of an hour, one summer afternoon very long ago, when he had slipped away from his nurse and let the warm sea breeze lull him to sleep as he watched the clouds from the cliff near the village. He had protested then when they had found him, waked him and carried him home, for just as he was aroused, he had been about to sail in a golden galley for those alluring regions where the sea meets the sky. And now he was equally resentful of awaking, for he had found his fabulous city after forty weary years. But three nights afterward, Karanis came again to sell a face. As before, he dreamed first of the village that was asleep or dead, and of the abyss down which one must float silently. Then the rift appeared again, and he beheld the glittering minarets of the city, and saw the graceful galleys riding at anchor in the blue harbor, and watched the ginkgo trees of Mount Erin swaying in the sea breeze. But this time, he was not snatched away and like a winged being settled gradually over a grassy hillside till finally his feet rested gently on the turf. He had indeed come back to the valley of Uth Nargai and the splendid city of Selaface. Down the hill amid scented grasses and brilliant flowers walked Karanis over the bubbling Naraxa on the small wooden bridge where he had carved his name so many years ago, and through the whispering grove to the great stone bridge by the city gate. All was as of old, nor were the marble walls discolored, nor the polished bronze statues upon them tarnished. Karana saw that he need not tremble, lest the things he knew be vanished, 
or even the sentries on the ramparts were the same and still as young as he remembered them. When he entered the city, past the bronze gates and over the onyx pavements, the merchants and camel drivers greeted him as if he had never been away. And it was the same at the turquoise temple of Nath Horthath, where the orchid-wreathed priests told him that there is no time in Uthnargai, but only perpetual youth. Then Karanis walked through the street of pillars to the seaward wall, where gathered the traders and sailors and strange men from the regions where the sea meets the sky. There he stayed long, gazing out over the bright harbor where the ripples sparkled beneath an unknown sun, and where rode lightly the galleys from far places over the water. And he gazed also upon Mount Aran, rising regally from the shore, its lower slopes green with swaying trees and its white summit touching the sky. More than ever, Karanis wished to sail in a galley to the far places of which he had heard so many strange tales, and he sought again the captain who had agreed to carry him so long ago. He found the man, Athib, sitting on the same chest of spices he had sat up on before, <clears throat> and Athib seemed not to realize that any time had passed. Then the two rode to a galley in the harbor, and giving orders to the oarsmen, commenced to sail out into the billowy Serenarian sea that leads to the sky. For several days they glided undulatingly over the water, till finally they came to the horizon where the sea meets the sky. Here the galley paused not at all but floated easily in the blue of the sky among fleecy clouds tinted with rose. And far beneath the keel, Karanis could see strange lands and rivers and cities of surpassing beauty spread indolently in the sunshine, which seemed never to lessen or disappear. At length, Athab told him that their journey was near its end and that they would soon enter the harbor of Saranian, the pink marble city of the clouds, which is built on that ethereal coast where the west wind flows into the sky. But as the highest of the city's carven towers came into sight, there was a sound somewhere in space, and Karanis awaked in his London garret. For many months after that, Karanis sought the marvelous city of Celeface and its sky-bound galleys in vain. And though his dreams carried him to many gorgeous and unheard of places, no one whom he met could tell him how to find Uth Nargai beyond the Tenarian hills. One night he went flying over dark mountains where there were faint lone campfires at great distances apart, and strange shaggy herds with tinkling bells on the leaders, and in the wildest part of this hilly country, so remote that few men could ever have seen it, he found a hideously ancient wall or causeway of stone zigzagging along the ridges and valleys, too gigantic ever to have risen by human hands, and of such a length that neither end of it could be seen. Beyond that wall in the gray dawn, he came to a land of quaint gardens and cherry trees. When the sun rose, he beheld such beauty of red and white flowers, green foliage and lawns, white paths, diamond brooks, blue lakelets, carven bridges, and red-roofed pagodas, that he for a moment forgot Celeface in sheer delight. But he remembered it again when he walked down a white path toward a red-roofed pagoda and would have questioned the people of that land about it had he not found that there were no people there but only birds and bees and butterflies. On another night, Karanis walked up a damp stone spiral stairway endlessly and came to a tower window overlooking a mighty plain and river lit by the full moon. And in the silent city that spread away from the rear rank, he thought he beheld some feature arrangement which he had known before. He would have descended and asked the way to Uthnargai had not a fearsome aurora sputtered up from some remote place beyond the horizon, showing the ruin and antiquity of the city and the stagnation of the Reedy River and the death lying upon that land as it had lain since King Kinnerathalus came home from his conquests find the vengeance of the gods. So, Karanis sought fruitlessly for the marvelous city of Celeface, and its galleys that sail to a Saranian in the sky. Meanwhile, seeing many wonders, 
and once barely escaping from the high priest, not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery on the cold desert plateau of Lang. In time, he grow, grew so impatient of the bleak intervals of day that he began buying drugs in order to increase his periods of sleep. Hashish helped a great deal and once sent him to a part of space where form does not exist, but where glowing gases study the secrets of existence. And a violet-colored glass, sorry, gas, told him that this part of space was outside what he had called infinity. The gas had not heard of planets and organisms before, but identified Karanis merely as one from the infinity where matter, energy, and gravitation exist. Karanis was now very anxious to return to minaret-studded Celeface and increased his doses of drugs. But eventually, he had no more money left and could buy no drugs. Then one summer day he was turned out of his garret and wandered aimlessly through the streets, drifting over a bridge to a place where the houses grew thinner and thinner. And it was there that fulfillment came, and he met the cortege of knights come from Celeface to bear him thither forever. Handsome knights they were, astride roan horses and clad in shining armor with tabards of cloth of gold, curiously emblazoned. So numerous were they that Karanis almost mistook them for an army, but their leader told him they were sent in his honor, since it was he who had created Uth Nargai in his dreams, on which account he was now to be appointed its chief god forevermore. Then they gave Karanis a horse, placed him at the head of the cavalcade, and all rode majestically through the downs of Surrey and onward toward the region where Karanis and his ancestors were born. It was very strange, but as the riders went on, they seemed to gallop back through time. Or whenever they passed through a village in the twilight, they saw only such houses and villagers, villages as Chaucer or men before him might have seen. Sometimes they saw knights on horseback with small companies of retainers. When it grew dark, they traveled more swiftly, till soon they were flying uncannily as if in the air. In the dim dawn, they came upon the village which Karanis had seen alive in his childhood and asleep or dead in his dreams. It was alive now, and early villagers curtsied as the horsemen clattered down the street and turned off into the lane that ends in the abyss of dream. Cranus had previously entered that abyss only at night and wondered what it would look like by day. So he watched anxiously as the column approached its brink. Just as they gallop up the rising ground to the precipice, a golden glare came somewhere out of the east hid all the landscape and its effulgent draperies. The abyss was now a seething chaos of rosate and cerulean splendor, and invisible voices sang exultantly as the knightly entourage plunged over the edge and floated gracefully down past glittering clouds and silvery coruscations. Endlessly down the horsemen floated, their chargers pawing the aether as if galloping over golden sand. And then the luminous vapors spread apart to reveal a greater brightness, the brightness of the city, Celeface, and the sea coast beyond, and the snowy peak overlooking the sea, and the gaily painted galleys that sail out of the harbor toward distant regions where the sea meets the sky. And Karanis reigned thereafter over Uth Nargai and all the neighboring regions of dream and held his court alternately in Celeface and in the cloud-fashioned Seren Seranian. He reigns there still and will reign happily forever. Though, below the cliffs at Innsmouth, the channel tides played mockingly with the body of a tramp who had stumbled through the half-deserted village at dawn, played mockingly and cast it upon the rocks by ivy-covered Trevor Towers where a notably fat and especially offensive millionaire brewer enjoys the purchased atmosphere of extinct nobility. Thus concludes Celeface. And finally, we shall explore the blurry line between realities in this next story, Polaris. Into the north window of my chamber glows the pole star with uncanny light. 
all through the long, hellish hours of blackness it shines there. And in the autumn of the year, when the winds from the north curse and whine, and the red-leaved trees of the swamp mutter things to one another in the small hours of the morning, under the horned waning moon, I sit by the casement and watch that star. Down from the heights reels the glittering Cassiopeia as the hours wear on, while Charles Wayne lumbers up from behind the vapor-soaked trees that sway in the night wind. Just before dawn, Arcturus winks ruddily from above the cemetery on the low hillock, and Coma Berenices shimmers weirdly afar off in the mysterious east. But still the pole star leers down from the same place in the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message, yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. Sometimes, when it is cloudy, I can sleep. Well do I remember the night of the great aurora, when over the swamp played the shocking coruscations of the demon light. After the beams came clouds, and then I slept. And it was under a horned waning moon that I saw the city for the first time. Still and somnolent did it lie on a strange plateau, in a hollow betwixt strange peaks. A ghastly marble were its walls and its towers, its columns, domes, and pavements. Marble streets were marble pillars, the upper parts of which were carven into the images of grave-bearded men. The air was warm and stirred not, and overhead, scarce ten degrees from the zenith, glowed that watching pole star. Long did I gaze on the city, but the day came not. When the red Aldebaran, which blinked low in the sky but never set, had crawled a quarter of the way around the horizon, I saw light and motion in the houses and the streets. Forms, strangely robed, but at once noble and familiar, walked abroad, and under the horned waning moon, men talked wisdom in a tongue which I understood though it was unlike any language I had ever known. And when the red Aldebaran had crawled more than halfway around the horizon, there were again darkness and silence. When I awaked, I was not as I had been. Upon my memory was graven the vision of the city, and within my soul had arisen another and vaguer recollection of whose nature I was not then certain. Thereafter, on the cloudy nights when I could sleep, I saw the city often, sometimes under the horned waning moon, sometimes under the hot yellow rays of a sun which did not set, but which wheeled low around the horizon, and on the clear nights the pole star leered as never before. Gradually I came to wonder what might be my place in that city on the strained plateau betwixt strange peaks. At first, content to view the scenes as an all-observant, uncorporeal presence, I now desire to define my relation to it, and to speak my mind amongst the grave men who conversed each day in the public squares. I said to myself, this is no dream. For by what means can I prove the greater reality of that other life in the house of stone and brick, south of the sinister swamp and the cemetery on the low hillock, where the pole star peers into my north window each night? One night, as I listened to the discourse in the large square containing many statues, I felt a change, and perceived that I had at last a bodily form. Now was I a stranger in the streets of Olithoa, which lies on the plateaus of Sarkis betwixt the peaks Nutton and Cataphonic. It was my friend Alice who spoke, and his speech was one that pleased my soul, for it was the speech of a true man and patriot. That night, had the news come of Dicus' fall and of the advance of the Inatus, squat, hellish, yellow fiends who five years ago had appeared out of the unknown west to ravage the confines of our kingdom, and finally to besiege our towns. Having taken the fortified places at the foot of the mountains, their way now lay open to the plateau, unless every citizen could resist with the strength of ten men. 
for the squat creatures were mighty in the arts of war, and knew not the scruples of honor which held back our tall, gray-eyed men of Lomar from, luth- from ruthless conquest. Alos, my friend, was commander of all the forces on the plateau, and in him lay the last hope of our country. On this occasion, he spoke of the perils to be faced, and exhorted the men of Alathoa, bravest of the Lamarians, to sustain the traditions of their ancestors, who, when forced to move southward from Zabna before the advance of the Great Ice Sheet, even as our descendants must someday flee from the land of Lomar, valiantly and victoriously swept aside the hairy, long-armed cannibal Nafkes that stood in their way. To me, Alus denied a warrior's part, for I was feeble, and given to strange faintings when subjected to stress and hardships. But my eyes were the keenest in the city. Despite the long hours I gave each day to study of the Nakotic m- manuscripts and the wisdom of the Zabnarian fathers, so my friend, desiring not to do me to inaction, remor- rewarded me with that duty which was t- t- second to nothing in importance. To the watchtower of Thapnin he sent me, there to serve as the eyes of our army. Should the Enatus attempt to gain the citadel by the narrow pass behind the peak Nutten, and thereby surprise the garrison, I was to give the signal of fire, which would warn the waiting soldiers and save the town from immediate disaster. <clears throat> Alone I mounted the tower, for every man of stout body was needed in the passes below. My brain was sore dazed with excitement and fatigue, for I had not slept in many days. Yet was my purpose firm, for I loved my native land of Lomar and the marbled city of Alathoa that lies betwixt the peaks of Naughton and Cataphonic. But as I stood in the tower's topmost chamber, I beheld the horned waning moon, red sinister, quivering through the vapors that hovered over the distant valley of Banath. Through an opening in the roof glittered the pale pole star, fluttering as if alive and leering like a fiend and tempter. Methought its spirit whispered evil counsel, soothing me to traitorous somnolence with a damnable rhythmical promise which repeated over and over. Slumber, watcher, till the spheres, six and twenty thousand years, have revolved and I return to the spot where now I burn. Other stars anon shall rise to the axis of the sky. Stars that soothe and stars that bless with a sweet forgetfulness. Only when my round is o'er shall the past disturb thy door. Vainly did I struggle with my drowsiness, seeking to connect these strange words with some lore of the skies which I had learnt from the Nicotics manuscripts. My head, heavy and reeling, drooped to my breast. When next I looked up, was in a dream, with the pole star grinning at me through a window from over the horrible swaying trees of a dream swamp, and I am still dreaming. In my shame and despair, I sometimes scream frantically, begging the dream creatures around me to waken me ere the Inatos steal up the pass behind the peak Naughton and take the citadel by surprise. These creatures are demons, for they laugh at me and tell me I am not dreaming. They mock me whilst I sleep. Whilst the squat yellow foe may be creeping silently upon us, I have failed in my duty and betrayed the marble city of Alathoa. I have proven false to Alos, my friend and commander. But still these shadows of my dream deride me. They say there is no land of Lomar, save in my nocturnal imagining. Then in those realms where the pole star shines high and red Aldebaran crawls low around the horizons, there has been naught save ice and snow for thousands of years. And never a man save squat yellow creatures, blighted by the cold, whom they call Eskimo. And as I writhe in my guilty agony, frantic, to save the city whose peril every moment grows, 
vainly striving to shake off this unnatural dream of a house of stone and brick south of a sinister swamp and a cemetery on a low hillock. The pole star, evil and monstrous, leers down from the black vault, winking hideously like an insane watching eye which strives to convey some strange message yet recalls nothing save that it once had a message to convey. Thus concludes Polaris. Thank you for listening to me read you these stories. Now, with any luck, you've long since slipped into your own world of dream, hopefully devoid of the thing in moonlight. Regardless, I hope you come back again for another story in the future. Pleasant dreams.